All right, High Rollers, we've had some great poker authors on the show before whose narratives have painted for us a poker and gambling landscape full of wonderful, engaging characters. Michael Craig, Nolan Dalla, James McManus, to name a few. Today, the man who authored Blood Aces, the wild ride of Benny Binion, the Texas gangster who created Vegas poker. Yes, today we learn about the legend that is Benny Binion, the man who started it all. Doug J. Swanson, our guest today. Doug, thanks for joining us, man. This is a real thrill. Hey, Derek. Great to be with you. So happy you agreed to take some time out and chat with us because when we talk poker... Obviously, we glare in amazement at the cash on the table. You know those bricks of cash when it's heads up at the World Series of Poker? And the man who started all that way back in 1970, probably had the idea years before that, was Benny Binion. You picked a great subject. Yeah, I was surprised. I mean, I knew he was a good subject going in, but I was really, really happy as I did the research to find out what a great character he was. Well, let's talk about the character because... You know, I, I've spoken to some gamblers who met the man, and they say that on the floor, if you were square, he was a super guy, very kind, very funny. But if you crossed the line, if you cheated, he could turn nasty. That's true. He was often described as the best friend you could have and the worst enemy you could have. You did not want to cheat at Benny Binion's casino. They didn't call the cops. They took you out back and handled uh, justice their own way. At the same time, he was a tremendously compassionate individual, and people were exceedingly loyal to him. I talked to people in the, in the course of my research again and again and again, who years after Benny's death were still talking in just most glowing of terms about the man. They loved the man because he engendered this loyalty. It kind of takes that character to rise the ranks, right? Because... That gambling world back in the day is kind of seedy at times. I mean, the mob was involved, and to rise those ranks, you have to be sort of violent, you have to take care of your uh, opponents, but you also have to have that outer face of, hey, I'm a good guy, I can tell stories, I'm funny. That You have this attraction, people want to be around you. Well, people did want to be around him, and he had that common touch. I mean, at the Horseshoe in Las Vegas, he didn't have an office, he just hung out in the, uh, in the restaurant there. Uh, near the casino, and, and anybody could come up and talk to him. And he loved to uh, entertain visitors, especially those from Texas. But you know, if you were just a if you were a farmer from Iowa and you saved up all your money to go to the horseshoe, you could walk right up and talk to Benny, and, and you know he greets you like uh, like you were his long lost cousin. People really loved that. How does a guy from you know nowhere, essentially from Dallas, uh, you know, I guess he was out in a farm or something. How does a guy? you know, way out there in the boonies, rise the ranks, become a legend in Dallas, in that big city, and then become a legend in another big city, Las Vegas. Well, he was a really smart guy, number one. He was illiterate. He couldn't really do multiplication tables or uh, and couldn't read very well, if at all, could barely write. But he learned the trade uh, with his father initially going out across Texas with these uh, roving gangs of uh, horse traders who uh, weren't always honest. And then he fell in with the traveling uh, gamblers who would go from town to town back in the early 20th century all across Texas and have you know, gambling operations in back alleys and hotel rooms and places like that. And then he learned the trade that way. So he, he came up, that was his education. He used to say that was his Harvard, was uh, hanging with these, with these old-time gamblers. So he learned the trade early on, but he also learned he had to be tough. I mean, you know, the week the week didn't survive that environment. That was a very harsh environment. Yeah, he really took care of his opponents. He didn't want to cross them. I mean, he killed a guy in Dallas, correct? Yeah, he was a bootlegger before he was a gambler uh, in Dallas uh, during the uh, during Prohibition, and there uh, was a rival, a uh, couple of rival bootleggers. Well, one one rival bootlegger who got in his way, and uh, and Benny killed him, and then Benny got in the numbers business, and uh, there was a rival numbers operator, and Benny killed him. So, you know, you didn't, you didn't want to cross Benny. You didn't want to be his competition uh, because uh, you wound up dead. Now, he was kind of pushed out of Dallas, and he, he sort of had to take up Las Vegas? Well, one of Binion's great strengths was he made friends everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean including the county courthouse and the police station and the sheriff's office. And the most powerful man in, in Dallas, the most powerful law enforcement figure in Dallas, was also Benny Binion's best friend. So that's how Benny stayed out of trouble. He also paid a lot of bribes in Dallas. But in the early 1940s, uh, there was an election and Benny's candidate lost. He no longer controlled the sheriff's department. He no longer controlled the district attorney's office. And they told him, uh, you either get out of town or you're going to be arrested. 
<laughs> I mean, it really is like the old west, right? It's time to yeah, get out of yeah. town. Exactly. I mean, that, that's exactly what it was. And he loaded up his car, his Cadillac, uh, allegedly put a million dollars in the trunk. He had two of his uh, his henchmen who carried Thompson Thompson submachine guns, and they headed out for Las Vegas in the early 1940s. And that's where he made himself anew. Wow, I mean, that's incredible. You hear stories of the old-time gamblers where they had a gun in their holster, they had a gun at the table, gun in their sock. I mean, this guy's carrying around submachine guns? It was that bad? Well, he didn't have to carry the submachine guns. His his guys carried the submachine guns. <laughs> yeah, he always had a pistol in his boot. I mean, you know, that's the way it worked back then. That's that's That was just life back then. You talk to some of these old-time poker players, and I'm sure you have, you know, back before... They played their games in fancy hotels. They were they were doing it on the down low, and and they often were robbed. So they they carried sawed off shotguns with them, just as you know, a tool of the trade. You talked about his appeal, and I guess with gamblers, he had a lot of it. That's where he came from. You talked about his experience with his dad and his friends. Um, so he gets to Vegas, and I guess that's how he makes his mark. He climbs the ranks. He gets binions, and he's making friends with all these names. Is that how it works? Yeah, I mean, he did it the same way in Vegas that he uh, did it in Texas. He made friends with the powerful people on both sides of the law. Uh, he, he worked out an arrangement with the mobsters after some initial friction that he did his business and they did theirs. But he also controlled people in law enforcement. And by controlled, I mean bought them off. And so they stayed away from him, too. He bought off the regulators. He, you know, he, he spread the money around. You write that he was kind of starstruck by Bugsy Siegel, and uh, what impact did the flamboyant opening of the Flamingo have on Benny Binion? Oh, he was, yeah, he was starstruck. He was flabbergasted. He loved it. I, I called Benny Binion the Will Rogers of mobsters because he rarely met one he didn't like. He loved all these guys, and they loved him. That's that's just the way he did business. But yeah, he was there at the opening that first night, and uh, he really had a great time. And when he opened the horseshoe, he, he took some tips from the from the flamingo. I mean, the horseshoe was not a fancy place, but it had some nice touches. And what Benny wanted to appeal to were the common people. He wanted them to come in and, and feel rich, even if you only had you know twenty bucks in your pocket. He wanted you to feel like a millionaire. And he was one of the first guys to take all bets. Is that correct? Yeah, no limit. First bet was your limit. So <laughs> you come in, you put down 500000 that's your limit right there. Because I guess a lot of operators at the time were afraid to offer that because the bigwigs would come in and try to clean them out. Yeah, and, you know, they're looking at the at the bottom line from week to week, month to month, and, you know, Benny took the long view. Uh, there was a there's a country singer named Larry Gatlin who uh, I talked to. Unfortunately, I took talked to after I wrote the book, but I was talking to him about something else, and he had known Benny, and he recalled... Uh, one day that uh, he was sitting in the in the horseshoe restaurant with Binion, and one of the pit bosses came up and said, "Hey, uh, Benny, there's a guy out here who wants to put down a hundred thousand dollars on a roll of the dice. Can we do that?" And he said, "Benny looked at him and said, hell, it's a damn gambling joint, ain't it?'" <laughs> and that was, you know, that was Benny's approach. Benny, Benny figured rightly he was going to win it back in the long run. He might he might lose that first big roll, but. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, he was going to get it back. And, you know, he did. He was, a, he was a tremendous success. You know, I read somewhere that Benny's business philosophy was good food, good whiskey, and good gamble. Does that sum it up? Oh, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the food was cheap, but it was good. Uh, a lot of the beef for the steaks, for the cheap steaks, came from his uh, ranch in Montana. But as I said, he wanted you to have a good time. And it didn't matter if you were some... Uh, uh, you know, high rolling movie star, or you were just a guy off the farm. His 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 goal was to uh, to treat everybody like they were royalty. That was his business model, and it worked really well. How long has Blood Aces been around, and what kind of reception has it received? I can only imagine it's been good because I mean the book is incredible. Well, thank you. I, it was uh, published first published in uh, August of 2014. Uh, the reception's been good. The reviews were good. Uh, I've heard lots of nice things. I've had some really good uh, talks in Dallas and Las Vegas to uh, people who were interested. You know, we come out and uh, and be part of the audience. And I've I've met some fascinating people who knew Benny Binion and had some great stories about him. And as I said earlier, the loyalty endures even after all these years. I mean, people almost tear up sometimes when they talk about him. Uh, and you can make the argument, you know, that the people who love him are still around and the people who hated him were uh, died an early death. Uh, 
uh, you know, the people who knew him, when they talk to me now, they, they are, are fervent in their admiration for the man. Well, he's certainly uh, held in high regard in the poker and gambling world indeed. I know you're an investigative reporter. You do a lot of work in the Dallas area. In your research for this book, you use that experience, I guess, to obtain access to secret FBI files. First of all, how did you do that, and what did you learn from them? Well, they're not really secret. I mean, they're public record. You just have to request them from the FBI. A lot of those records, though, had not apparently been uh, seen before because I found stuff in there that had not been published. For example, Binion, you know, Binion went away for tax evasion, went to Leavenworth for a few years. That's how they got him. And he never really trusted the FBI because they had a role in putting him away. However, uh, years later, as he became an older man, he became a confidential informant for the FBI. And wow. It's right there uh, in the FBI records. He was officially as designated by J. Edgar Hoover, an FBI confidential informant. That had not been published before, but that, you know, that was sitting there in the records. There's no one happened to see it. But it's not secret. It's a public record. It's just you have to make a request to the FBI for those records. What was his relationship like with uh, J. Edgar Hoover? Well, Hoover kept wanting Binion to flip the big guys in Vegas. I mean, you know, Hoover wanted to put away uh, some of the money launderers and, and the, the mobsters who were skimming off the Vegas proceeds, and I don't think Binion ever gave them any really valuable information. I can find no record of that in the FBI files. I think, though, well, I know that that was Hoover's hope, that Binion would become his big insider. I don't see anything in the records that show that that ever materialized. Now, besides your book, I know there's a big gambling division at the UNLV Library. There's the legendary Gambler's Book Club in Las Vegas, of course. What kind of collection is there out there on Benny Binion? Is there a lot written about him? No, that was uh, my big surprise, a pleasant surprise. Um, my book is the first full biography of him. There has been a fair amount written about him, but only in pieces you know, here and there. A lot written about the World Series of Poker, obviously. So I didn't uh, spend a whole lot of time in my book talking about that. I mean, there have been any number of books about the World Series of Poker. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Jim McManus and Nolan Dollar early on. Uh, those, those guys are great, and I, I learned a lot from those two. But being himself, there's not been uh, a tremendous amount written about the entirety of his life. So I was really happy to discover that uh, that gap and, you know, tried to fill it in. Do you think, uh, well, let, let me ask you about the World Series of Poker first. Uh, 1970, the story goes, I guess it started from the Gamblers Texas Convention or whatever that's called, uh, and then it became the World Series of Poker. That's where Benny got the idea. Could he ever have imagined back then what it's grown into now? Oh, he said that he couldn't believe what happened. I mean, he, he, you know, early on, he just had a handful of players, and I think at some point he said he hoped to get maybe 50 to 75 players. That was the big goal. And of course, it's gone way, way, way beyond that. But as you know, it, it started out at the horseshoe right there on the casino floor. They didn't even have a poker table to begin with, and they had to move some of the uh, the other tables out of the way, the, you know, the roulette and the, and the blackjack and all that, just to play poker. And when it started out, people just stood there and watched these uh, these big poker names, like Doyle Brunson and, and the others, play poker. And now it's grown into this huge worldwide enterprise on, you know, on ESPN and millions of dollars in, in purses and thousands of players. But no, he never envisioned that. It was just a publicity stunt early on just to get people into the casino because he knew if uh, you came in to watch the poker players, you'd do that for a while and then you'd walk over to the blackjack table and lose your money. That was the plan. The World Series of Poker has certainly grown. I mean, it's it's remarkable now, and I guess all the big stars of today owe it to Benny Binion. Um, can you comment briefly on his family and some of the drama uh, that's unfolded with uh, you know his sons and daughter and the selling, I guess, uh, of the World Series of Poker? Yeah, uh, he had five children. Two of them have died. Jack Binion, uh, who was instrumental in helping Benny start and continue the World Series of Poker. Uh, Jack's probably familiar to a lot of people. He's been in some TV ads for the other horseshoes that have been developed in other parts of the country. Uh, Ted Binion was the problem child. He was a he was a Binion's son uh, who was a, an extremely bright guy. Some people called him a genius at uh, calculating odds, but Ted had drug problems and other problems, and uh, he died under some mysterious circumstances. Maybe he was murdered, maybe he wasn't. You know, there were some people convicted of uh, killing him, but that was overturned later. Uh, so that was a, that was a big tragic problem. And once Benny 
died uh, in the late 80s, uh, the, the family fought over the assets. That was a cent- finally settled, and, uh, and the horseshoe was sold to uh, Harris, which now you know has the World Series of Poker. But it was a long, difficult process. I can only imagine. Um, lastly, I guess back in the before we talk about your other projects and your website, uh, back in the day when Binion was running Binion's Horseshoe and things were lively, I guess the atmosphere must have been electric. Was it was Benny like a rich man just flushing money? And what was the atmosphere like in the heyday? You know, on a Saturday night at Binion's when Benny was there. Yeah, Binion was a rich guy, but you know it was all in the family. This was not. Uh, a corporate arrangement like much of Las Vegas has become. This was a family operation. And you know, they would take the money and take it back to the county room and, and put it in a big pile. And when that pile got too big, they'd put it in another pile. And that's the way they, they kept track of their money. Uh, it, was, it was just everywhere. And you know, Ted Binion was uh, famous for allegedly uh, burying uh, uh, millions of dollars in silver out in the desert. Uh, so they, they had an unconventional approach to money. But, yeah, the horseshoe was the place to go. If you were a stone gambler, that's that's where you went because there was no limit, and that's where the gamblers were. They didn't have any floor shows. They didn't have any magicians. They didn't have any ventriloquists, no bands. Benny always said he didn't want his money flowing out the end of some guy's trumpet. You were just there to gamble. You know, you weren't you weren't there to hang out with the Rat Pack or, or see Jay Leno or watch a, 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 a boxing match or anything like that. You went to the horseshoe to gamble. Well, I, I was lucky enough to get to the horseshoe one time. I'm up here in Canada, but I got there one time, uh, you know, where the wall is with all the world champions, and it was damp and musky, and it was just dark, and it just had a great feel to the place. You know, I could just feel the legend's presence. Yeah, there was, a, you know, the cigarette smoke sort of hung to the walls, and uh, some of the carpet probably needed replacing and all that. But, yeah, it was a fantastic atmosphere. And, you know, it was, as I said, it was, just, it was for gambling. The book is called Blood Aces. The author is Doug J. Swanson. And Doug, you've got a website here. It's DougJSwanson.com. This is your first piece of nonfiction? You, you've written other novels, right? Yeah, I've written five novels. This is my first nonfiction book. And I'm working on another nonfiction book right now on the, on the Texas Rangers, the law enforcement organization. So that'll be uh, book number seven. Book seven. Wow. Now, if I can get you to sum up Benny in three words before I let you go, could you do that? Uh, sure. Um, fascinating, compassionate, dangerous. There you go, folks. Doug J. Swanson, really appreciate your time, man. I appreciate this today. Hey, thanks, Derek. I enjoyed it.